right here. This is from, well, it was Lydia's PayPal from yesterday. I didn't get to the Nick Cave, which I actually think we've done all. I seem to remember there being loads more than what was in there. Maybe I found the old email email of Nick Cave stuff, but um. Anyway, the email I did find had this documentary, which we definitely haven't done. Uh, so yeah, this is because Lydia did say one Mark and one Nick, but we hadn't done Mark Lanigan for so long that ended up doing four. Um, and now I thought I'd do this, yeah. So Nick Cave, straight to you documentary. It will be part one, but yeah, let's go. is a bit like I, um, you know, when you, I don't know if you know this or not, but when you go to a party and you drink too much and you wake up and uh, the next day and you just want to go home, uh, I feel like that quite a lot actually, but I don't really have anywhere to go. Isn't that sad? Along the loom of the lane, the mission bells peel from the town. from a country town called Wangaratta. My father's dead, but my, my mother's alive, and um, they both had a very positive attitude to, to me working in any creative area. My father was a very creative man and uh, worked in theater and was an English literature teacher, and my mother also. Um, yeah, my mother was very encouraging. They, they wanted me to be a painter, basically. They thought, I, I guess they thought painting was a little bit further up the, the ladder than being a rock musician. Not financially. Dictated what I listened to, basically. I was under his uh, the heavy hand of my older brother. So consequently, I ended up listening to a lot of English progressive rock music, like the Moody Blues and Genesis and Propel Harum and Yes. And, you know, the list is endless. But um, so I, I, had a, I had most of my teenage years was consumed with that kind of crap, really. And then uh, I discovered uh, in a record shop, Raw Power, 
and thought the cover looked really good and bought that and things changed for me. See, I'd have thought more Jim Morrison in uh, Velvet Underground, especially in the early stuff. So that's kind of surprising that it was yes, and but then I suppose it kind of makes sense for his kind of crazy creativity and yeah, all them bands he named are of that same thing. Dancers on all fours. Dancers on all Well, the reason why we left Australia was was that it, it had become uh, impossible to work there in a way. I mean, we'd been we'd been playing for I don't know. We'd been together for about three years or so. And we've been playing to the, exactly the same audience for that time, and it, and it never developed. We felt completely alienated toward everything, Sit and fish. that's what came out of it. it. Was very, very violent, very aggressive shows. If we had have been a a little more well adjusted to the world that we were living in at the time, we would have played different sort of music, but we weren't. <laughs> <laughs> I think we, we started to travel, um, started to look at other groups and realised that um, we could do a lot better with our music and take it a lot more seriously. time I ever saw Blixer I was in Holland and there was a, a kind of special on Ernst and de Neubauten on the TV. The whole band just sort of stood there transfixed by this performance by this incredibly weird group and just thought it was the best thing we'd ever seen. And uh, then, then I think a couple of nights later I, I met him in some bar somewhere and we got on very well and um, became friends, you know. And then we, we shifted to Berlin and we, we were very good friends there in Berlin. We spent a lot of time together. Um, we were uh, waging the war against sleep, as Blixer would, would put it. We didn't go to sleep very much, basically. Brother, my cup is empty and I haven't got a penny But if I no more whiskey, I have to go home Oh, brother, my cup is empty and I haven't got a penny But if I no more whiskey, I have to go home
when I first uh, went to Berlin, one of the first places I ended up staying was Christoph Dreyer's place as the leader of Die Haut. And um, he, he let me and many of my friends stay in his, his loft for uh, an uh, incredible amount of time. And we, we became very good friends in the process. And he had his uh, Die Haut, which were a German instrumental uh, guitar band, I guess. Uh, going at that time, and we kind of became. Uh, I started writing songs for them. We made a record together, and the whole thing's just kind of continued on through the years, really. Die Gäste, mit denen wir arbeiten, sind eigentlich alles Freunde seit Jahren. Also mit denen wir öfter zusammengearbeitet haben, mit denen wir zum Teil zusammen gelebt haben. Wir haben zum Beispiel Nick haben wir kennengelernt, als wir unsere erste Tour gemacht haben als Support Band für The Birthday Party. Hi Christoph, are we doing another thing now? Or what? I need a fix cause I'm going down Back to that bitch that I left uptown <laughs> Nick Cave was wild back in the day It really Because you like see him when he's younger And it's this like really, like he said, aggressive re Like extreme creativity, do you know what I mean? Just wild creativity And then that kind of he then goes on to write some of the most beautiful songs you'll ever hear. Songs like Into My Arms, which is just a beautiful, beautiful song. It does remind me of Chris Cornell in that, because you watch Chris when he's younger, and you see him with Soundgarden on stage in a sweaty, smelly club with people jumping on the stage and... Do you know what I mean? He's stomping around in big boots, all sweating and stinking. And then he goes on to write something like Seasons. It's it's, it's amazing. It's just yeah, a real musical journey for both of them. But yeah, hold on two secs. I need some more coffee. Yeah, let's finish it. Let's go. And if you're going to San Francisco ridiculous <laughs> You look beautiful, Nick The experience in Berlin changed my life, definitely um, Gave me a uh, Gave me a confidence in myself, really to, you know, just to go ahead and do exactly what I wanted to do and not to worry about the way other people thought of you and so on. Um, which is very much a, a, a kind of Berliner attitude. There's a devil wing outside your door. No, much no. And he's bucking and bringing and pouring at the floor. That's another one. And he's howling with pain and crawling up the wall. Oh yeah, he's weak with. That's another tune, and it's another Peaky Blinders tune as well. Peaky Blinders has a great soundtrack. Evil and broken by the world. He's shouting your name and he's asking for more. Uh, 
I've been basically tugging, tugging away at the same theme for years, or the same themes for years, um, and uh, and the, the, these are my obsessions, and the, the, the things that I'm just genuinely interest, interested in writing about, and will continue to write about. The most difficulty writing a song for me is, is uh, coming up with the initial idea of what to actually write about. Once I've thought of that and, and find the uh, one line that basically represents this song, then, then the writing of it's relatively easy, actually. Spooked by the new shadows that she cares, that she cares. Across, across the sad waters and across. When no nothing's coming uh, lyrically, I sit down at the piano and sort of bang away like that. But music that I write uh, on the piano that hasn't got lyrics to it is usually quite meaningless to me. Occasionally you can write uh, a good riff or something like that that's kind of a good tune or something like that. But um, basically the, the lyrics are sort of foundation stones to the, to the songs. If I write a good set of lyrics that I'm really happy with, then the music is just comes like that. It's very, very quick. I mean, the songs suggest the music, really. Like an old Joe. You can stay or you can run. But your trial is yet to come. Like an old Joe. Let's do that one. I get uh, very inspired by people that I know and uh, often see it as my job in a way to, to um to somehow document the types of people that they are and I mean in 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 uh, Dia in the song Diana, that was definitely definitely the case. I was so, uh, so besotted by this girl at the time of writing that song that I felt uh, that it was necessary to to um, document what she was like and the, the the feeling that I had when I was with her, <clears throat> which was basically that we could do anything um, and anything would be okay. I don't write enough songs to be able to pick and choose, really. I mean, I just, I just write what I can and what comes out and, and use it. And uh, the people around me, if, if, the, if, if it sometimes appears that the people around me come off badly or that I'm, that I'm over kind of critical or, over, or, or I'm angry at these people, it's, um, uh, 
It's generally because I write and uh, I, I write songs very often in this state of mind. Um, but I, I think the people, you know, the people around me understand that. Oh, well, I got a woman. member of the band is, is quite free to express themselves however, however they like and they're tolerated um, and and we find the idiosync idiosyncrasies of each member quite interesting quite funny really so you know we, we, there's very little bitching going on between us there yeah this is a good documentary it's a good documentary and i just like nick cave to be fair i love his insane world but yeah he's just great great songs i can't believe i forgot about lover lover man in it there's a different that's a great tune and i completely forgot i remember doing that but yeah I forgot all about that. Yeah. Definitely gonna have to, um, yeah, get that up on Spotify. But yeah, that's part one. That's the reactions.